Welcome to the reInvent Nuclear Security series. And where this week, this session, we're going to be looking at an alternative future for the National Nuclear Weapons Labs. I'm Peter Leiden. I'm the founder of reInventors. And I'm sitting in for Erica Gregory, who is the ongoing host of this series and who will be back for that session next week. Now, the United States uh, currently supports three nuclear weapons laboratories that are largely carrying out the mission for the last 70 years, which is to develop and maintain America's nuclear weapons arsenal. Uh, but in the spirit of this reInvent Nuclear Security series, we want to kind of just step back and, and take a look at that default strategy and to really think deeply about the status quo and to what could actually change in the coming decades. So if we look out 10, 20, 30 years, what should the mission of these nuclear weapons laboratories or nuclear security labs really be? Uh, where should we be putting that kind of brain power, those kind of resources? Uh, what, what, where the, what should they be working on? What kind of risks? How much should be going still to the nuclear weapons issues, but what should be actually devoted to other national security risks? Now, we're partnering in this series with N Square, which is a new organization supported by five really of the most kind of leading foundations out there in this space. It's the MacArthur Foundation, the Plowshares Fund, uh, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, and the Skoll Global Threats Fund. Now this group, because we're not in this round table going to be talking about unilaterally dismantling the labs in it by any sense. On the other hand, this group, N Square, is really trying to think about new ideas about how can we stop nuclear proliferation, how can we really ensure that no nuclear bombs do go off in the near term here, and ultimately how we do make progress on eradicating nuclear weapons altogether. Now, We've got a fantastic group assembled here to really talk about these new ideas. And the new ideas, by the way, one last thing on that, is the foundations uh, backing this effort are really interested in supporting and promising new ideas that could come out of these discussions and others that are going on around them. So uh, we actually have a real chance here to try to move the ball. Now, we've got a group here that is really terrific, fantastic group to kind of work on these new ideas. And so what we're going to do right now is go around the table and have everyone introduce themselves a little bit about who they are and what they bring to the table. And I'm going to start with Peter Schwartz who's done these before with us. Peter, tell us who you are. Good morning. Uh, nice to see you, Pete. Uh, I'm Peter Schwartz, the Senior Vice President for Salesforce uh, in San Francisco. I've had the pleasure of working with and knowing Pete for a very long time. Uh, uh, his hair wasn't so gray and his beard wasn't so gray when we first started working together. Uh, but I've also had uh, extensive experience over the years in working with a number of the national labs, uh, LBL, Livermore, uh, Sandia, uh, Los Alamos, and so I have some views uh, on where things ought to head and where they might be headed. It's great to have you here. Uh, Elizabeth, do you want to actually uh, give us a little sense of your background and what you bring to the table? Oops, you got to unmute there. Sorry about that. Is Libby? Um, I come at this issue. Uh, I've seen, I've observed the laboratories and, and issues surrounding the labs and, and their focus areas from a number of different vantage points. I'm reporting from Silver Spring, but I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, about a mile from Sandia. Um, I only say that just because I'm a proud New Mexican. Um, uh, I've seen it from the Senate position. I used to work for Pete Domenici for about four years uh, at the beginning of this millennium. Um, then I was at a think tank for about eight or nine years where the last year I was there I wrote a report on, uh, it's entitled Leveraging Science for Security, a Future for the Nuclear Weapons Labs uh, in this Century. And I'll probably speak more to that. And then I've, I've spent, since about 2009, I've been sort of in the management uh, consulting world, mostly working with federal agencies that do non-proliferation programs and again interface very heavily with the laboratories. Um, so I'll try real hard to remain at 30,000 feet, but, but my baggage is that I'm inside the beltway and, and know way too much about, about the institutional edifice of, of the laboratories. <laughs> It's great to have you. We have a nice balance here today of people, insiders and outsiders, and it's a nice mix of folks. Uh, Ray, do you want to give us a little of your background? Sure. My name is Raymond John Lowe. I'm a professor at University of California, Berkeley. I'm a geophysicist, and I study materials at high pressures. 
Some of that work I do in collaboration with colleagues at the National Laboratory, so in that sense I'm a tiny bit of an insider. Um, but by and large, uh, that's, uh, I should uh, emphasize, that that's entirely academic basic research. By and large, I also have a broader interest in nuclear nonproliferation and nuclear weapons issues, and I've served as an advisor to the laboratories and also to various parts of the U.S. government, as well as to the University of California in that domain. Um, one thing that's relevant to today's discussion is I uh, had the privilege of serving on a few uh, committees within our National Academy of Sciences over the last few years that have been engaged in some reviews of the management and the directions of the national laboratories and I hope to bring in some of the uh, insights that my colleagues uh, were able to bring together in those particular studies. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, Gregory, why don't you introduce yourself? I'm a professor, Gregory Benford, at the University of California at Irvine. Sort of an insider because I was a postdoc for Edward Teller at Livermore and then became a staff member. And I worked on fusion physics, but also the design of tactical nuclear weapons. I also worked as a Soviet specialist because I spoke German and Russian uh, for the Central Intelligence Agency, mostly as an advisor, and, but occasionally as a field agent. Um, I've worked with the National Lab since I left Livermore and came to be a professor at Irvine uh, on a lot of these sorts of issues, particularly advanced technologies. And my focus basically on, on the technologies of the future rather than the past and also a bit on ensuring that our warheads work, about which many of us have some doubts. But Gregory, I think it would be remiss if you didn't say a little bit about what you're also known for. You are a renowned science fiction author, so do you want to say a little bit about that? That's oh, yeah. relevant here. I've written a number of uh, science fiction novels, actually 30. Uh, much of them are about how scientists think and work, because that's the landscape I know. I've also written a bunch of nonfiction. Uh, uh, several books. Uh, so I'm better known to the public as a writer than as anything else, but that's true. Most people are in my situation. Uh, and uh, I've even worked in Hollywood, but that's a tragedy, of course. <laughs> Anyhow, we want that imagination work and looking ahead. Uh, James, do you want to give us your background? Yeah, thank you, Peter, and I want to thank reInventors for the opportunity to par participate in this roundtable. It's really a great uh, thing. I watched the earlier one on new technologies, and I was very impressed with that, so it's really exciting for me to be involved. I am a uh, laboratory insider in the fact that I worked there for almost 17 and a half years, or 16 and a half years from 1997 until just uh, this past summer. And I now, now I'm an independent nuclear security specialist. I'm working with Plowshares. I'm working with Harvard University and a couple of other little projects. And my background at the laboratory was in the nuclear nonproliferation division. The main technical skills there are measurement, control, accounting, and security for nuclear materials. And also uh, the International Safeguards Mission, where we assist the International Atomic Energy Agency with making sure that countries that have civil nuclear energy programs don't divert any of that technology or material to a military program. I've also done quite a bit of research on arms control verification technologies with the Russian Nuclear Weapons Institutes, for example, on how you might verify the actual dismantlement of a nuclear warhead. Great to have you here. Um, Paul, introduce yourself and then we'll and then we'll go to you shortly. Go ahead. Well, thank you and thanks uh, Pete and everyone. Um, I, I guess maybe I'm an insider outsider as well. I started my career <coughs> working in, in a congressional research agency called the Office of Technology Assessment. And the first study I was associated with was what to do with nuclear materials from dismantled warheads. This was in the early 90s when we were rapidly dismantling quite a number of warheads. And then I worked in the Department of Energy, although not at the National Labs. I worked on the Environmental Cleanup Program, um, which is basically a responsibility to clean up as best as possible and safely dispose of the waste and contamination from the production and the historical legacy of the, of the nuclear weapons uh, endeavor. But for the last 15 years, I've been um, in the philanthropic arena, focused on nuclear security, the Plowshares Fund, 
funds a, a range of organizations and individuals that do analytical work, media work, and, and frankly, advocacy work to reduce the risks from nuclear weapons and, and stop their spread. And um, the labs are just sort of a particular interest of mine because while I was working in DOE and in Congress, um, issues around information classification, um, just sort of public understanding about um, the Department of Energy and the labs and the nuclear weapons complex became a, a strong interest of mine. And so um, I'm very happy to, to be here and hear what people have to say and think. Before we jump into the discussion, as smart as everybody is here, and that's an awesome group, um, we've got folks watching uh, on the reInventors website in the G Plus environment. Uh, pe people can actually give their ideas, ask questions there. We have people watching that. We can cycle it in. Also, if you're through Twitter, you just use the hashtag reInventors, and we will be monitoring that as well. We'll cycle some of it into the conversation today, and if we don't use it, we'll also be using it in our package of write-ups and videos that will come after this. So let's start with Paul. Paul, why don't you set the framework of what we're trying to accomplish here, and then we'll jump into the roundtable. Great. Well, thanks very much. I'm going to try and be as efficient as I can, but I would like to take just a couple of minutes to set what I feel is a, an important overview. But remember, what we're really trying to discuss here and generate some thinking and ideas around is what if we, had, if we were able to design three stellar and intellectually, intellectually talented national laboratories that were addressing national security concerns in the future, the next 10 to 30 years, you know, what, what would we have them work on? How would we allocate and emphasize those priorities? So that's, that's really the big picture thinking and discussion we want to have today. But I feel it's really important that we ground that in the reality of today. What we do have, um, actually, a constellation of 17 national laboratories under the auspices of the Department of Energy three of which have as their primary mission and have had as that mission over the last decades the design, testing, evaluation, maintenance of nuclear weapons, of the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And I think it's really important to get some grounding in numbers. You know, what scale are we talking about in terms of, of outlays of dollars? So over the last several years, now these are, are approximate numbers, but I think they give a good order of magnitude. The National Nuclear Security Administration, which is the subset of the Department of Energy that is charged with our nuclear weapons enterprise, both maintenance of safety and security, but also running non-proliferation programs, has been spending on the order of about $11 billion a year on a whole variety of programs. About $6 billion of that goes to these three nuclear weapons labs, or as they're currently deemed national security labs. And those three are the Las, Los Alamos Nuclear Lab in Los Alamos, New Mexico, the Lawrence Livermore Nuclear National Lab in Livermore, California, and the Sandia National Lab in Albuquerque. And Sandia also has sort of some co-located located people and facilities in Livermore as well. Now, in the last year, the rough sketch of the budgets for Los Alamos was about $2.2 billion. Sandia was about $2.7 billion and Lawrence Livermore was about $1.1 billion. Notably, the largest allocation in, in all three of these labs was for what is called nuclear weapons activities. These are programs that entail things like uh, the life, lifetime extension programs for specific bombs, specific warheads in our arsenal. They support things like stockpile stewardship and maintenance. And um, I'll give you a rough sketch of the profiles of the labs. Los Alamos National Lab, 65% of its $2.2 billion budget was for nuclear weapons activities last year. For Lawrence Livermore, 84% of its $1.1 billion budget was for nuclear weapons activities last year. And Sandia, which is an interesting case, was about 54%. Still a, still a majority, but, but a much less so, was for nuclear weapons activities. So roughly in that $6 billion number, 3.8 is for nuclear weapons activities, or about two-thirds. Now, the labs also do the converse, I would say. Others may disagree with that characterization. They have programs that look at non-proliferation issues, materials, physical materials control and disposition, technologies to detect maybe countries, maybe non-state actors attempting to steal or improvise nuclear devices, um, a whole range of things. These are on the order of several hundred million dollars a year. So again, um, if you follow the money, it, it tells a story. Uh, recent budgets at the labs 
for non-proliferation activities was about $185 million at LANL, Los Alamos, $134 million at Lawrence Livermore, and about $200 million at Sandia. Now one, one thing I would note about these numbers, the trend is upward for nuclear weapons activities and downward for non-proliferation. And the point I want to make there is that these three labs are intimately tied to the much larger U.S. national defense budget and posture. The budget, uh, the president's budget was introduced yesterday to Congress. It contained notable increases in the National Nuclear Security Administration, notable increases in the Department of Defense budget for strategic nuclear weapons modernization programs. So the question, you know, to us is, are these the right things to be spending precious federal dollars on with respect to our greatest national security threats and what is often called the crown jewels of U.S. science, the national heretofore nuclear weapons labs, now the national security labs. The other programs, just so people are aware, that these labs work on outside of nuclear weapons activities include cleanup, fossil energy research, nuclear energy research, non-weapon science, energy efficiency and renewables, things like supercomputing initiatives, mapping the genome, climate science. All of these other endeavors compete for that remaining $2.2 billion. So this is sort of a sketch and maybe a, a mental pie chart for, for where as a country we put our money. Now finally, I want to end with my introduction by mentioning, um, you know, these labs do undergo reviews from time to time, sometimes congressional reviews, other times outside agencies and so on. We are not the first, and hopefully we may be the last, because we'll succeed, to, to ask the question of how should these labs be oriented and how should these resources be allocated. And just earlier this year, the National Academy of Sciences, through the National Research Council, published a study looking at these questions. And one of the things they found, which is very telling, I quote, is that although the National Nuclear Security Administration labs are now by law, referred to as national security laboratories rather than nuclear weapons laboratories, no one has clearly articulated what this evolution means in terms of the mission of the labs or the proper relationships with other national security agencies and laboratories. So in one way, I feel like that is the question we can help answer. Thank you. Awesome setup, uh, Paul. Um, let's just jump right into the conversation here and I think we've got a baseline there but instead of figuring out how do we slowly build out of the baseline let's just think big about the next 10, 20, 30 years like what should we be doing with this, uh, this these resources and Peter why don't you just start you think a lot about scenarios of the future do you want how would you start thinking about what to do here and we'll roll into the whole round table well you know I think there are several fundamentally different possibilities uh, and, and it's worth remembering, uh, why are we having this conversation? We're having this conversation because in the early 1990s, we believed the Cold War ended, that the enterprise of the national labs was part of a 50-year uh, Cold War uh, beginning in the late 1940s, and, you know, Los Alamos was where in some ways it began. Well, actually, Livermore was right there with them at the same time as well, uh, LBL. And so uh, uh, that was the enterprise that those labs uh, supported was uh, the, the competition with the Soviet Union and to a lesser extent China uh, and was involved in non-proliferation activities and so on. So a fundamental question for the future in terms of scenarios is uh, are we moving back into a renewed Cold War, uh, maybe even a hot war? Uh, you know, I think uh, the events uh, with Russia recently uh, raise serious questions. You know, many of us, myself included, hoped that you know we were headed toward 50 years of relative peace and prosperity, and uh, the Russians have now begun to raise serious questions about that uh, in the Ukraine and Crimea and so on, and with some activities that have raised questions about their willingness to adhere to the non-proliferation regime and the strategic arms limitations and so on, testing new weapons, cruise missiles, uh, you know, uh, advanced warheads and the like. So it, it isn't clear that the assumption that lies behind the you know the desire to change uh, the, the the weapons labs into for some other purpose and so on will persist. We may find ourselves in a new competition to which you can add, of course, all the, the smaller powers, the Iran's, North Korea, etc., uh, that might end up playing here in one way or another. So, I think uh, uh, that scenario one is a renewed Cold War, and the question 
you know, begins to change fundamentally. So that's scenario one. Scenario two is that we manage to pull back from uh, the possibilities of a new conflict uh, uh, or a new uh, sense of tension that is persistent, even if it isn't a hot war. Uh, and, and that is that other challenges uh, uh, pose themselves as even more consequential. Uh, and that uh, the most obvious one is climate change. Uh, these labs are not well suited to doing many things, but they are well suited to doing many of the things that are necessarily associated with meeting the uh, uh, challenges of climate change. And uh, uh, in fact, I've been involved in projects at Livermore and LBL uh, in particular that have been involved in looking at uh, the future of policy, the future of technology, the roles that the labs can play, and so on. And there are very useful things, everything from uh, alternative energy technologies to uh, building advanced modeling technologies for simulating climate change and so on. Indeed, uh, I was involved when I was at SRI in 1977 in one of the first global climate modeling efforts that was actually funded by then, it was IRDA before DOE, to look at the question of were we looking at global cooling and did we need more energy? Now, in fact, we reached the opposite conclusion, was that it was about to start warming again, and it was gonna, we were going to need that. But I, I think it is a reasonable task to think about the question of climate change as a kind of civilizational crisis, in the same way that the Cold War represented, I think, a, a kind of civilizational crisis, the potential for ultimate destruction. And in this case, we also have the potential for, in some sense, ultimate destruction. I think the single biggest technical challenge our civilization faces is clean energy. How are we going to power this civilization for the next thousand years, you know, uh, when the oil actually does begin to diminish, when we diminish hydrocarbons for reasons of climate change? We're going to need better nuclear. We're going to need better renewables. We're going to need things like fusion and so on. So these labs are well suited to that purpose. So if we take the challenge of climate change as really a massive one, not just marginal, then I think that represents a second class of scenarios. Maybe there are other things, you know, stopping the asteroids from hitting the earth and so on. But having said that, I, I think the most obvious one is climate change. So that's the second scenario. The third scenario I'll call failed change. Uh, and that is that changing big organizations uh, of any sort, public or private, uh, is extremely difficult and one that has a deeply entrenched uh, culture with a particular set of infrastructure with a long history and mission uh, is a non-trivial challenge in organizational change. And I don't have any trouble imagining various failed efforts that don't get very far, you know, that uh, end up in a series of studies and a series of, uh, of efforts that kind of are more disruptive than helpful. Uh, and uh, now, the one glowing example of actually, I think, uh, successful change is uh, LBL. Uh, you know, uh, when I first uh, uh, moved to the Bay Area, LBL was known as the Rad Lab. Uh, and the Rad Lab was the Rad Lab because it was all about radiation. And it was still perceived as part of the nuclear weapons complex. However, that evolved. And so much of the research at uh, LBL now is focused on renewables and other things. Uh, I had the happy experience of meeting my wife. Uh, at uh, LBL when I gave a lecture on energy and the environment, Shell, the, the Hollowell Prize. And I gave a lecture. My wife was in the audience, and, as they say, the rest <laughs> of the history. Uh, but the point well, is that it was looking at environmental issues and energy and so on, even back in 1985 when this happened. So, uh, you know, the, the evolution of LBL is a positive signal uh, for the potential for change. But the third scenario I'll call failed change. So those are the three scenarios. New Cold War, uh, the great challenge, mostly climate change, and uh, failed efforts to change. Awesome setup, and um, and it did show you that we can't like bank on, on one scenario or the other. Uh, James, you had some ideas to jump in, and uh, we'll go around the table with other ways to respond to Peter's frame. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, I wanted to return to uh, what Paul mentioned in his introduction, and that is that two-thirds of the spending at these national security laboratories are devoted toward nuclear weapons. And I think if you included Oak Ridge National Laboratory and Pacific North Northwest Nuclear Laboratory, the two places where we produced uranium and plutonium for our weapons program, you would have a similar breakdown still for, for things concentrated on nuclear weapons. But as I go about my day as a citizen, and I think about what my children are doing as they travel abroad and they are going to be experiencing their lifetimes over the next 30, 40, 50, 70 years, I don't worry about being attacked by a nuclear weapon 
for two-thirds or more of that time. I think about other challenges and other security concerns that are not only our nation faces, but uh, we face as an international community. And uh, nuclear weapons don't keep me safe from um, climate change, the consequences of climate change. They don't keep me safe from the depletion of other natural resources. They don't keep me safe from ISIS, Islamic State, or an outbreak of Ebola, or a financial crisis. So I would say, look, we have to think about where we're putting our national defense dollars as a nation compared to the threats that we face. And I would also point out that even with the conflict that's occurring in Ukraine, I don't worry about an attack, uh, a nuclear attack from Russia, and I don't worry about a nuclear attack from China, and I don't worry about a nuclear attack from North Korea so much. So the, the main point is, how do we redefine the national security labs to provide a better return on, on our national security investment as we go forward 10, 20, 30, 40 years in the future? A lot of good ideas out there. Uh, Gregory. Let me throw a uh, small cat among all these pigeons. Uh, a science fictional one, in fact, to lead off with. I'll have, I have three things I want to mention, but number one is a program I think we could uniquely do at a national lab, and that is the revival of the nuclear thermal rocket, which the United States developed in the 60s and 70s, and again in the 90s, in a classified program, tender wind, and the Soviets developed. Uh, we actually test fired a, a nuclear thermal rocket, which interestingly gave very, very little radioactive effect in the open air in Nevada for about 100 hours. The Soviets did so at Palo, Simi Palatinsk for 1,000 hours. So it's an existing, though needs to be updated, technology. The reason to talk about this is that's the fundamental thing you need in order to explore the solar system. And I want to emphasize that expanding the prosperity of the planet is going to demand the use of resources beyond our atmosphere in the long run. But it also engages the human spirit. If you want to deflect an asteroid or send humans to Mars, you're going to have to do it with technologies like this. And you cannot do it very well at all with the rockets we have. The nuclear thermal rocket uh, has a capability, it's, it's four times more efficient than the Saturn V, for example. That's an a rocket that operates in space alone, does not take off from the ground. That's just an example of a kind of thing that the national labs could work on, and uniquely so, and it links immediately to business. This is exactly what, say, Elon Musk would like to see in the future on the scale of a decade or two. I know, because I asked him about it. Um, that's one thing national labs could do that's completely out of the box, or at least I think it is. Second thing is, uh, I'd say the overall prosperity of the planet demands that we develop, as, as uh, several have said, nuclear capabilities for energy production that are considered, or actually are, safer than the bugaboo that attached to them now. Um, that, and, and let me throw yet another cat in. Um, I have done a bunch of the work, starting, by the way, with the people at Livermore and at Oak Ridge on the geoengineering. I'm a pessimist about climate change. I think we're not going to avoid large-scale climate change, and geoengineering will be at least a palliative. It cannot fix it wholly, but it can lessen the effects. And by that, I mean things like the reflection of sunlight by uh, uh, sulfur dioxides in the stratosphere, um, particularly in the Arctic, which I work for, by the way, um, on, uh, in detail, uh, particularly with the Arctic Council. Um, but also things like reversing the, uh, the acidity of the ocean, which you can do with some geoengineering work that's been directed by, in fact, Greg Rao at UC uh, Santa Cruz. So my point is to, to look outside at technologies that aren't on the table right now, but we can see have a good chance of being effective but they should be done at a large level, and they should be done by the people who know things, uh, uh, in, particularly nuclear things, in the labs. And so those are three proposals that link also to the long-term problem of the prosperity of all humanity. We can't keep elevating the bulk of humanity to prosperity and just use the resources of the planet, and we have to do it in new and original ways. Yeah. I'd, just, I'd like to jump in, if I may. This is Paul. Um, I want to tie two things together that, that uh, Peter Schwartz said and that Greg just offered. The, the scenario three, which is failed change at, at 
at the labs. You know, these are entrenched bureaucracies. They're political animals as well as bureaucratic ones, and they're economic ones. Um, and so, so what I want to do, I guess, is um, not so much a question but an observation. Your first scenario, Peter, about you know Russia, Ukraine, or a new Cold War, it, it, it is frightening, and yet there's a lot of reaction in that vein. And I guess I would suggest that how we respond to that is is a political decision. I mean, it's a policy decision, obviously, but it, it's a political process. And we could say, oh yes, Russia, or you know maybe more to the point, Putin is flexing muscles. But boy, we learned something over the last Cold War, and we're not going to go down that path again. Now, maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but we could have, you know, the perception of a of a Cold War 2.0, and not necessarily have Manhattan Project 2.0. The the second thing I wanted to say with respect to the failed change scenario, what what um, Gregory said about Elon Musk, to me this hit on something I'm very curious about, and I love other people's point of views on this that are much more expert about the labs. I often will say to people, if you're a young postdoc, you know, and, and you want to go somewhere, you're not thinking Los Alamos or Livermore like you might have been in the 60s and 70s. You're thinking Google or Facebook or Twitter. And and I realize I don't have a lot of evidence to support that. It's an assumption. But what, what you just said, Gregory, about some of these, you know, completely futuristic ideas and, and out of the box, I think that's what we need to be talking about. And so the question, more concrete question is, there are some facilities at these labs and, and others in the national in the DOE complex that um, have pretty unique facilities. You, you've worked on fusion yourself. There's the Z-Pinch machine at Sandia. There's the National Ignition Facility at Livermore, which is, I think, controversial. And it's also not um, a model of, of fiscal efficiency. But that being said, there are things at these labs that are unique, and yet they're behind a very formidable secrecy wall and, and literally a fence and many academics or general scientists don't have easy access to them even if they know about them. So I'm, I'm curious, is that an issue that, that we can resolve? Is that something, do people have ideas about how to get around that? Ray, I think one of you, you're exactly that guy. Yeah, let me jump in. Uh, so this is Raymond John Lowe again. Um, on this last point, actually, ironically, uh, you're hitting on a theme that's of uh, great interest at the laboratories. Uh, they are working hard, have worked hard, to make some of those major facilities accessible to the outside world. I happen to lead one of the academic teams that has an international collaboration uh, conducting experiments on the National Ignition Facility. I will uh, reinforce the point you made, which is that these facilities are not easy to get to, and that's simply because they're very large. Uh, it takes a lot of time and effort and expertise to get plugged in, but it's not, I think, because of the shroud of secrecy so much as these are very sophisticated, uh, large-scale facilities analogous to, let's say, getting engaged in collaborations at, at the CERN facility in, in Europe, just as an example. I wanted to pull back for a moment and just um, put a reminder that our national policy is indeed to uh, work towards de-emphasizing the role of nuclear weapons in our national uh, defense and national security. I'm speaking in very broad terms, making reference to the president's uh, famous speech in Prague a few years ago. But of course, as part of that formula is also the statement that the U.S. needs to maintain capability as long as there are nuclear weapons around the world. That's a national po uh, policy. And so to the degree that people don't agree with that, it's uh, important to use our system and turn that policy around. But having that policy, I think it's clear that the laboratories play a role, at least on the intellectual design strategic research end of maintaining that capability. And I wanted to comment a little bit about the connection then between the capability to design weapons versus the nonproliferation capabilities now I'll make a very general statement. This is true not only in the area of nuclear technologies, but also in cyber technologies and biotechnologies, or even with reference to chemical weapons. Work that is done for defensive purposes, excuse me, really can, if one wants to, technically be turned to offensive purposes. So medical research that is specialized on looking at how to counter biological weapons can in principle be used to design biological weapons. 
that's not what we do in the United States, but I just wanted to make that point as a technical person because it comes back to the question of the balance between the non-proliferation, the international security, arms control arena, who trains the inspectors, who trains, who develops the technologies for inspectors on the one hand versus nuclear weapons design. From a technical point of view, I have to emphasize that those are very intertwined subjects. Uh, again, that uh, don't get me wrong, that doesn't say that we shouldn't be talking about them. To the contrary, these make uh, the, the topics of great interest for public discourse, but they are technically very intertwined. Great point. Let me jump in here on your perspective and your history on this stuff. Yeah, I'm going to try to touch on a, a couple of points that have already been raised. Uh, um, specifically, I wanted to, to um, comment that uh, 20, 30 years out is really hard for a DC uh, mindset. Uh, we kind of think in two-year cycles. Um, but the way I've come to think about about this issue is that it's not it's not either or with respect to going to zero. Um, Ray mentioned the the Prague speech vis-a-vis -vis the modernization sort of agenda. At least in at least in my mind, and one of the elements that I think is key is recognizing institutionally all of the wherewithal that the labs have come from the nuclear weapons program as the core mission. So until we get to a point where we break away from from the core mission supporting the diversity that really is the laboratories and the other work that they do for not only for DOE but but for the other agencies and sort of the national security mix and we're not going to break out of uh, out of the problem that is expressed just in budgetary numbers let me touch on that that point for just a minute because it struck me that on the on the cover page for this dialogue it was it was phrased as the nuclear industrial complex and I know what you're what what's being riffed on there <clears throat> but it really is an industrial age uh, construct it's too large it was scaled to the Cold War I don't think anybody questions that and it's extremely extremely inefficient in terms of how it goes about its core mission never mind the national security uh, related science and technology that, that it does produce. So I think it, from, from my mindset, the, the trick is trying to figure out institutionally how you break away from nuclear weapons being the cornerstone of what the, rap, uh, 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 of what the laboratories do. And this, this would, I, I think I would refer here to, to the comment about the scenario of climate change. Um, climate change is the one issue area that I hit upon, um, if we could get the political consensus to turn the key and say this is the agenda, all of these other things can fall under that issue area with respect to energy uh, production, energy efficiency, the nuke piece, whether it's energy or the weapons piece and the non-proliferation piece, that appears to be the only, thematically the only thing that I can I could tag as the next grand challenge that is of the scale and of the potential impact that we in the Cold War era, era faced as sort of an existential threat. Before I leave this for a moment, that's kind of the rub because until you figure out how to marshal the political will behind that idea, behind the, the calamity that, that would be the, the product of that, um, you, you can't get the forces in Washington to move away from what is essentially benign neglect related to, to that nuclear industrial complex. Unless they're from a state that has one of the laboratories or one of the production sites, they don't pay any attention to it. So it, it becomes very divisive and, and very much uh, an issue of uh, what is Russia doing now and can we tag it to what Putin's doing now without any thought related to what really do the nuclear weapons bring to the table in, in this construct. Um, so I'll leave, I'll leave it at that for now. 
Peter, did you want to jump in? I know James yeah. in after that. Go ahead. Let, let me just throw in a couple of quick comments. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, like you, I think, uh, Libby, uh, the climate change is a kind of existential crisis and, and one for which the, well, the labs are, are well suited, as I suggested. Um, I think it is also the case that one of the interesting things that the labs can do, and we've seen a, a several examples of this, is to be the source of spit outs. Uh, I've been a director, for example, of the Santa Fe Institute, which is an interesting research organization that came directly out of Los Alamos. Uh, living in Berkeley, as I do, uh, I see a number of companies uh, in Berkeley, Emeryville, etc., that are, uh, uh, in sense, directly or indirectly spin-outs of LBL and Lawrence Livermore Labs. Uh, so it is, uh, like Stanford, like Cal, a source of intellectual capital that feeds the economy, feeds so on. And we could be a bit more systematic about that if we wanted to really uh, build on that. Uh, so I think that's a, a second arena. And then finally, I just want to comment on something that uh, Greg said, uh, which is about the nuclear rocket. I, I actually saw the facilities in, in, in Nevada. And, um, you know, I, I think we're not going to respond to climate change until we really see, you know, the climate actually hitting in a big way. Unfortunately, I think that's the reality, just like Putin changed the game by invading the Ukraine. Uh, you know, it's going to take some big climate disasters. Uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, if we actually detect an asteroid headed our way, which is not at all implausible, uh, that you will see a bit of a, a rush towards seeing if we can get the labs to help solve that problem. So I think, un unfortunately, political realities, I think, uh, are, are quite fundamental, Libby, as you suggest, and I think the public doesn't respond well in advance. I think they respond to the perception of, unfortunately, imminent crisis. You know, I lived through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and, you know, there's no question, man, the Cold War took amped up after seeing the B-52s at the end of the runway with my father with the engines running. You know, you took it really seriously. Uh, and so uh, I think, unfortunately, the realities of the politics are that it takes that real perception of imminent threat. Yeah, well, I will say about this, though, um, you know, as we're sitting in a pretty serious drought in California, and there has been a lot of things that it's now starting to shift the plug. In fact, the Times just ran a very interesting poll just over the weekend here, if you saw that, where the vast majority of Americans now are thinking we need a government intervention in climate, including the majority of Republicans. So I think this could be breaking quicker, but then again, just, just throwing it out there as an optimist. <laughs> James, you had an idea, and then Paul, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. I wanted to, um, let's imagine for a minute that we uh, can agree that the laboratory infrastructure is too large and that we don't need three laboratories dedicated to nuclear weapons work, but we do have to maintain our capabilities in the nuclear weapons field as long as they exist. So let's have one national laboratory that is devoted to the nuclear mission. What do we do with the other two? And I think that there is a vast untapped potential if you can uh, design a national laboratory network so it can encourage a new scientific ethic, global scientific ethic. And so these other two national laboratories would be devoted toward working on these problems that do not recognize national boundaries. And they could be the lead in terms of establishing a network of ne international nuclear laboratories with other countries around the world. And just in terms of uh, a portfolio of things that these laboratories could work on. Uh, sustainability, um, continued nuclear security, uh, energy security, clean air, clean water, the human machine interface, information infrastructure, and public health. All of which Awesome. A lot of original ones there, but Paul, did you want to jump in on this thing? Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, um, actually, two quick follow-ups. The, the, the climate change, um, I totally agree. I, in fact, our own uh, president, Joe Cirincioni, often compares the risks and threats from climate change and nuclear weapons as the only two on the, in the same echelon, although nuclear weapons you know, could end us overnight as opposed to you know, on a time scale of maybe decades. That being said, I, I want to give just sort of one more nod to, to politics, which is to say that um, I think it may have been Peter Schwartz earlier talking about climate change, but the phrase energy security may be one that's a little more politically palatable and feasible. Um, you know, I don't want to tie it to particular administrations or so much, but this seems to be one that to me not only would have a, an appeal to the scientific talent of the labs, we're going to work on energy security, domestic energy, 
opportunities and options, but also it could be an economic driver in a way that climate change writ large, it often just immediately becomes a political football and third rail. So, some, you know, words matter. And I would think the labs would more readily take on a mission and a mantle of energy security with the word security than climate change science or something like that. So just to throw that into the mix a little bit. Um, Jim, I like your idea about, you know, let's start from an assumption of we have, you know, back in the days when we had the red and blue team labs that were competing on different designs and we were in full-scale production, there was a reason to have a, a peer competition. Today there may not be. Um, many have questioned whether this is something from the past, having two labs. Um, we aren't designing new nuclear weapons from, uh, from scratch. And so I think that maybe is, is a way to ask the question. Let's assume we need certain capacities, but, but they don't need to be spread across three labs. If we maintain two non-nuclear weapons national security labs, what should they be working on? I, I like that idea. It's, it's, um, it's not the two-year beltway um, limitation that Libby talked about, but it also is more, I think, reachable for many humans because when they think 30 years out, they have difficulty going there. Awesome. Gregory, jump in. Um, that's an interesting idea, eliminating one of the three, for example. Uh, I would bet for, uh, on good odds, I think, that, that, that California will, will get one and New Mexico will get one. So it's only a question between Sandia and Los Alamos. But uh, 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 my expertise is not in politics, thank God. Um, and I do think that Indeed, a diverse menu and an opening out of the labs is a crucial way to think about them. Uh, I do believe, though, that there are, there's a lot of waste, and we should perhaps try to, in a reorganization of any kind or a refocusing, try to get rid of the waste. I happen to be an opponent of the Total Testing Ban Treaty, for example, because I think we're wasting an enormous amount of money. It's approaching, what, 80 to 90 billion dollars we spent on the stewardship program, and a lot of people who worked on particularly tactical nukes have severe doubts that, this, that the low-yield weapons actually do work anymore, but you can solve it easily by testing them under the ground every five years or so and get rid of that whole apparatus. And by the way, I'm not a big fan of NIF either. It's a, the, the, uh, the part of NIF that has never come true is the middle one, the I for ignition. Uh, it, it's a weapons simulator. In fact, I left Livermore because I didn't want to work on the precursor to that mission which has squandered many billions of dollars and I think not learned very much. Uh, I consulted Livermore afterward but I was not impressed with the results. Um, so I think a kind of an economizing point of view too. Let's get more efficient, let's get rid of, of, of programs which aren't doing us any good. We'll free up the resources to work on things such as for example geoengineering. I was just at at Stanford and uh, talking to my old friend Ken Caldera who was at Livermore and ran the group that's still there working on geoengineering. It's all climate simulations but he pointed out that there's no money anywhere for doing any even early design engineering or even experiments toward geoengineering mechanisms. So Greg Rao can't get any money to build a pilot project for reducing the, al the acidity of the ocean and people uh, who want to uh, say cool the Arctic in the summer with aerosols can't get any money to even do the preliminary engineering although we I, I did a study for uh, a certain agency uh, <laughs> actually DARPA uh, of what the economics of that would be and it's it's in the range of 200 million a year um, so the point is these are things we could and should have on the shelf I think and we're not developing them and they would be perfect for the national labs. These are new missions that they fit with the capability. Done. Good to hear from you, um, Gregory. Uh, Ray, let's go to you. We haven't heard from you for a little bit. Um, and uh, we also, unfortunately, are going to probably lose you a little bit earlier than the rest here. But uh, uh, what are you thinking about these big, there's a lot of big swings here. You kind of have a foot in the outside and the inside. I'm curious, Ray, on how you uh, you think about a lot of the big swings here, the big swing ideas, including the climate change idea. Thank you. Um, so, first of all, I uh, think that many uh, are in, uh, enthusiastic about the idea of broadening the mission of the laboratories, and that's in fact what's been behind 
if you want, the re renaming of what were the nuclear weapons labs to national security laboratories. I personally believe that that process is um, still very much a work in progress. Uh, conceptually, still what that means has to be worked out, let alone in detail implementing uh, the engagement of all the government agencies involved with national and international security and the like. So I acknowledge this work in progress, but personally I think that is a, an important direction for the labs to move in. I wish I could feel differently, but the world as it is now is uh, a dangerous place and doesn't look like it's going to get any less dangerous in the near future. So areas like uh, terrorism or challenges like terrorism small-scale wars, let alone large strategic challenges. Those are all things that I think will remain part of the national agenda and part of our national challenge for the coming future. With that in mind, it seems to me that the laboratories do have a role to play for the country. Now, we're all against waste, fraud, and abuse, and one can legitimately debate whether we need one laboratory, two, or three, or what the size of the budget is, but what I'm saying is I think the fundamental mission is still there. Put that way, I have to admit that personally I'm rather skeptical about redirecting the laboratories in directions that don't involve as a core element the security aspect. And let me explain that. It's not because the laboratories don't have great capability, in particular not only for very large programs but for very interdisciplinary uh, types of uh, activities. But the fact is one of the reasons these laboratories are expensive is because they do a kind of work that we cannot do in academia, namely working on sensitive technologies, by which I mean basically classified technologies. And they don't necessarily have to be classified in the military sense, but whether it's trying to develop technologies for homeland security, TSA and the like on the one hand, or for example trying to think about export control, there are many aspects of security that need to be looked at and that uh, require a certain level of secure cont containment of information. So those laboratories have that capability. We don't have that in academia. And so I just want to say as a business model, it's not a reflection on my colleagues in, in the laboratories, but one of the special niche ecosystems that they reside in intellectually is to pursue very high-end research almost in some cases call it quasi-academic, very long-range strategic research, but in the context of these sensitive technologies that otherwise in academia we're not pursuing. And by the way, yes, there's of course an industrial or a private sector component to many of these activities, dominantly, for example, in areas like cybersecurity, but the reality is a lot of the security research, security-related research, um, actually is not all that remunerative and therefore again one can make a case that in addition to whatever can be done in academia, whatever can be done in the private sector, in the business sector, there is a role to be played by the uh, national laboratories, national security laboratories. And so again, I like the ideas that are being floated. I think this is great to have outsiders as well as insiders uh, pitch in with new ideas and, and suggestions not only of the big vision, but also how one would implement them. So I'm turning back to Libby Turpin's point is how do we actually get from here to there in a political sense, in a realistic step-by-step -step manner. I think these are all great things to think about. I just wanted to put on the table there's a special role for a capability that involves doing high-end, I mean high-quality, but also leading-edge research in a security environment, and that necessarily means with a certain containment of information, which is really not something that um, we, we want to do in academia. I want to make it clear in academia we thrive on having very, very open discourse, completely international uh, engagement of students, scholars, researchers, and the like, and that's something we treasure and benefit from, and in many ways the laboratories provide an important complementary environment uh, to that that we have in academia. And oh, by the way, the laboratories do there are thereby um, collaborate with both universities and with the private sector in these domains. 
Terrific. Thanks for that setup. You know, let's go to Libby right now, um, because one thing that I think we've underappreciated here, and, and it, um, there was a lot of talk in the first session about uh, the real challenge of nuclear, you know, decentralized nuclear terrorism, suitcase nukes, um, locking down on, on a kind of a new era of, of nuclear security where it's not bottled up in states, but really running around uh, in possible terrorist hands. I mean, to what extent is there a lot more that could be done in nuclear proliferation spaces, a lot more done on sensors or transparency or, or, or other kinds of initiatives that could really make us safe from that as well as any other things that that, uh, that decentralized threat might do? And you had some thoughts on that, and you've done a lot of work on the proliferation. Yeah, so let me return for a moment to, to the fog speech, and then what flowed from that was the nuclear posture review in 2010. And again, a lot of people see see the the commitment to global zero and and a modern sort of safe arsenal as as a as a schizophrenic. But what I was trying to suggest is, without those baseline capabilities uh, with respect to the safety a minimum of the nuclear arsenal, um, you can't get the non-proliferation bang for your buck, if you will, in terms of the scientific wherewithal to answer some of the really hard questions with, with respect to the, the proliferation threats that, that we confront. Here's a little bit of the rub, and it's what I was trying to allude to with respect to, to the weapons, to the laboratories being tethered to the, the core nuclear weapons mission, and also the reason that I, that I jumped on the, the climate change bandwagon. These laboratories are, are, are built and intended for large, complex, multidisciplinary, often classified challenges. They're not good at the piecemeal stuff. And the mirror image of that, and that's why, that's why the core nuclear weapons money has been so fundamental to, to the last two decades of, of the enterprise. What's problematic now is that the mirror image of, of, of what you see in terms of the national security environment can be seen with respect to, to what's difficult about getting the vision and the momentum behind something other than the weapons program. And what I mean by that is it's really hard to construct a core uh, budget around a fractured enterprise, counterterrorism, maybe a bit of energy security, uh, you know, radiation detection equipment, new sensors, verification capabilities, I could go on and on and on with respect to a lot of things that the labs apply their, their, their knowledge and their expertise to, but it's all very piecemeal. So again, just to, to back up, the, the climate change as an umbrella is the only thing that I see that is, you know, as Paul mentioned, on the same echelon, if you will, as, as what we face during the Cold War. And it's just a, a, a product of the political, envir political environment it, it, that it's very hard to, to piecemeal your way to stable jobs and longevity within the, web, within the, the lab complex on a, on a fractured, very complex national security agenda. And hopefully that, that makes sense in terms of, of, of how I see it. Um, that's why the Stimson report that, that I that I mentioned at the at the front end of my introduction was was really intended to thread the needle there in terms of this is the institutional sort of makeup that would be requisite to have all the agencies in the room with skin in the game related to repurposing these, these national security laboratories toward a science and technology vision that pertains to a broader spectrum of, of threats and challenges. This is a, it's a great how you're going here because interestingly enough there's been a lot of uh, activity outside uh, from the audience. I just want to do a shout out here to the, those themes. I mean in fact we've got one uh, question here from Jay Coglin via G Plus uh, for actually for Jim. You know he recently released a new study called Essential Capabilities for Nuclear Security Include Encouraging Expanded Nonproliferation Work at the Lab you know, what are your main points? They're actually asking some of the things of that. Also, we had another woman, Lisa Owens Davis in G Plus, said, hey, R&D programs at the labs might be too diverse, lacking direction. You know, how, well, how can we actually get them kind of centralized? So it's interesting. We've got a kind of the group mind out there also trying to well, wrestle well, with these exact same themes. Can I, can I jump in for a, a second just on that point? A, a couple of the, of the studies have, 
and an, actually an ongoing study looking at the at all 17 of the national laboratories are trying to look at are they too uh, ad hoc? Are they appropriately aligned? Are the budget flowing where they should be? Um, that's still midstream and, and to be determined, but part of the part of the balance is allowing that talent to be expressed in the most efficient manner possible vis-a-vis -vis the federal uh, um, you know the federal government saying here are your lanes and don't step out of this area as as your priority and that's been a that's been a really tricky balance between between what DOE does as, as sponsors of these laboratories vis-a-vis -vis the laboratory's existential problem with respect to maintaining stable employment with respect to other agencies and the, what's called the work for others portfolio with laboratories. Um, and it's not, there is no easy solution to that piece, but, but that was also uh, wrapped into the Stimson report that I, that I referred to earlier in terms of trying to get, trying to get our arms around that and make, and make sense of it and find, find that balance in an institutional framework. James, why don't you just give a quick uh, summary of a couple of the main points of uh, the big swing points of your of the report, and then we're going to shift to a different topic or two. Sure. Oh, yeah. This study. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, well, there is a great deal of work that can be done at the national laboratories in this field of nonproliferation, verification, monitoring, and nuclear security. It it really addresses what I think are probably our more likely threats in the nuclear security field, and that is the acquisition of nuclear weapons by additional states, the possibility that terrorists could acquire nuclear materials uh, in an unauthorized manner and and build an improvised nuclear device, or the fact that um, these materials could be uh, exported in an unauthorized manner, and so there's a great deal of uh, technology, oh, and also the arms control reduction mission. If we ever do get to the point where we have a treaty where we are eliminating nuclear warheads, how do we verify that? Uh, the expenditures at the laboratories have been uh, modest over the years. I think there's a great deal of enthusiasm at the laboratories for uh, doing more of this work. I think that there's an understanding that they do have a direct application in the evolving nuclear security environment but they're never going to be uh, approaching the amounts of uh, attention and money that you have in terms of a warhead uh, life extension program, for example. N nevertheless, these things have also been unfortunately thought of, I think, as soft technologies, uh, soft power technologies. They're the tools of the diplomats and the arms controllers, but when in fact they really are smart technologies, and they're smart technologies for the nuclear security environment that we have now and in the future. And uh, also might inspire the next generation who are right now, the next generation of innovators are actually loving, you know, satellite imagery, the Google and, and uh, sensor technologies and nanotech firms. And there is a kind of a second wave of uh, soft technologies that might be where the energy of the next generation is. Uh, Peter, you had some thoughts, it sounded like. Uh, uh, yes. I, I, I actually want to come back in a moment to what you just said. But I, I, I want to go back uh, for a moment to the, the several comments uh, about uh, purpose and direction and uh, of, of the labs. Uh, we had a huge advantage uh, uh, in the early days of this institution and other similar ones like NASA and the National Cancer Institute. Uh, there was a consensus, you know, uh, uh, post World War II, no question, consensus, and a sense of pride about the National Labs. You know, all the mythology around the Manhattan Project and Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and all that, and Oppenheimer and Lawrence, and you know, th th there was a kind of magic. magic. Uh, to all of that story, uh, even with its controversies, etc., uh, and a sense of national commitment and purpose. Uh, we launched NASA similarly, right? You know, we're going to the moon, beat the Russians, and, you know, NASA is a bit adrift. It's aging and so on. Can't quite figure out. Is it going to the moon, the asteroids, Mars? Are we really doing manned space or not? And is it a commercial enterprise? You know, I, I think Richard Branson is going to buy the space station in 2025. It'll be the Virgin Orbital Hotel. Uh, you know, so uh, I, I, we – and National Cancer Institute, right? Nixon launched the war on cancer, so we were all going to solve cancer in the next 20 or 30 years. Well, these massive enterprises – 
you know, it, they need that kind of consensus to sustain a purpose and direction. And right now, none of them have that. And I think it's partly maturity, partly the passage of time, partly the evolution of the world. And I think it's going to be very difficult to achieve that kind of consensus uh, around that sense of purpose uh, that will really uh, energize and motivate. And I, and I go back to Libby's comment, and l like the others, I think the only one that really fits very well is uh, climate change. Now let me just add one little thing to, to the point you made a moment ago, Pete. Uh, and th that is that one of the things that is happening happening is that we are getting genuine alternatives to the massive enterprises. And a wonderful little example in San Francisco is a company called Planet Labs. And Planet Labs is building uh, uh, observing satellites that are about this big. That, that's about, uh, oh, not quite 18 inches. Uh, and uh, they've already got about 70 of them up there. I was at their headquarters the other day. In fact, uh, Greg, you'd be interested. I was giving the Starships talk to all their employees, uh, uh, my talk about the future of Starships. Uh, uh, you're in there. Uh, having said that, uh, the, the, the point is that uh, they are doing this with private money. Uh, they're going to be able to image. They're putting up about 150 satellites in Earth orbit, in polar orbit. They're going to image the entire planet every single day when the whole constellation is up. Uh, now, when you think about non-proliferation and so on, it's, that's actually an advantage. But all of it will be very public. All that data will be public. Uh, and high-resolution imagery of the Earth every single day of the entire planet. Now, that's a private enterprise spending tens of millions, not billions, uh, to undertake that task. So, you know, those kinds of options are now plausible in ways that they weren't before in the pursuit of cancer, in the pursuit of space flight and maybe in the pursuit of energy as well, and to deal with climate change. Love it, Peter. Um, well, let's, let's get to the point where, net, where you've actually brought up, how do we get from here to there? I mean, we had a bunch of ideas coming out through the course of this session, which are awesome. How can we redirect uh, where the labs are going? What are the new challenges? You know, that, all that stuff. But let's start thinking a little bit, and there's, it's come up repeatedly, how do we start to get to there? Um, so what I'd like to just kind of say is, you know, as, as we start thinking about this, we've had this way of maybe hooking to the climate change challenge. But I'd like to actually go to Greg, who we haven't heard from for a little bit here. And Greg, as someone who has actually uh, looks ahead and spins stories or scenarios of the future at some level, uh, thinking about your own work, I mean, how do you kind of envision some ideas of how we might remobilize people or reshift people or any kind of, any kind of insights into uh, and how we might actually shift the energy of the culture of America of whatever, to move the kind of energy around these left. Ray Bradbury once said to me that uh, NASA thinks it built the space program, but the actual guys who laid the foundations were the science fiction writers. And uh, it's, a plausible, it's a plausible argument, uh, because people recognize, say, threats, like asteroid threats. There have been two big uh, giant rock hits, Earth movies, very popular. I wrote one of the novels that came way before that. Uh, that's a threat everybody recognizes. That's a threat you can say you're going to deal with. Uh, and people don't ask the question. If you want to say, we're going to develop a nuclear thermal rocket to move large masses around with higher efficiencies and, and to have missions to asteroids and so forth, uh, and then we're going to go to Mars, we've already sold Mars to the American people. It's a done deal. If you say, we're doing something that will seriously mean we're going to explore the solar system, you will get real public support because one of the questions I get from a lot of, of people in academia is, why are we spending money on a space program that goes nowhere? And I hear that also from my relatives, where I grew up in a small town in southern Alabama. So it's pretty widespread. Um, I think going to known threats, fears, and opportunities is the smart way to get, get support, because every guy in the Senate, uh, guy and gal, is listening to the people back home and wonders, how do you sell arcane issues about national labs to them? But you can sell them threats and rewards. That's the PR angle to take, I think. Love it. Paul, jump in. You had a thought on this, too. Yeah, I think, I mean, this is a, it's, it's a sticky wicket that, that we're facing because, on the one hand, I am very, I, I completely agree that absent some type of unifying, we call it an external event or call it a national consensus on need and, and aim of the labs, it, then we're looking at a sort of an incremental political bureaucratic process, which is very unsatisfying and, frankly, probabilities of, of success are, are low. 
Um, this is again going back to, to Peter Schwartz's you know fail change approach. Um, you know, but the pullback scenario that you first laid out, where you know what, Russia, Putin, Ukraine, this 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 knee jerk reaction to well hold on a minute, um, let's not move so fast on the Prague agenda. Let's say that that diminishes. Um, I think, and I'd like, this is really just a devil's advocate question, I think maybe we need a strategy that's somewhere in between audacious and, and beltway. And what I mean by that is um, I do think big ideas are needed. I actually think they reside in, in many cases in scientists, uh, scientists in the labs. And it, it, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but my, my earlier comment about the you know the security culture of the labs because of their origins and the and the fence line, so to speak. It kind of works two ways. I imagine there are scientists working on programs in the labs that may not be classified, but they're not as readily published, as readily able to speak and disseminate um, just by virtue of of the acronym where they reside. Now that so, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is. It, it's a little bit of a blend. I, I think we need a maybe a medium approach that we think big, but we also realize the the challenges of the bureaucratic politics. Um, one one last thing I'll say that um, you know the labs themselves are a force as much as they are supposed to serve the national mission and needs and security apparatus. They have over the 70 years evolved as their own very strong advocate. I mean they. These lab directors fly to DC quite a bit, not just to talk about the great new science they're doing, but to make a case for why they're so important and why they should keep getting checks. So I, again, that may be <laughs> unsatisfying, but I think it's a blend of people like Peter and, and Gregory aiming for s the stars, literally, and then people like Libby and Jim saying, and here's what we need to do to sort of unshackle some of that inertia. Well, let's go to Libby, actually, and Jim. Um, and Libby, also, you said you mentioned you had a, a stint there as a strategy in the strategy world. What is? How do we start really? What What are the new strategies right now to really start to to shift the ball on practical, concrete things? In fact, technically, things that could be even funded by these foundations, for that matter. Any thoughts on what to do next? Yeah. Um very unsatisfactory, and in fact, uh, it might be a little bit repetitive of what Paul already stated. Um, and I would see it um, without some big exogenous event that really rattles the system. And, and, and think about 9-11 and what happened in D.C. So we stood up the Department of Homeland Security, and we reorganized the, the intel agencies. But, but it didn't fundamentally shift how we thought about this facet of, of our national security agenda. Um, so I would I would I would lean towards pragmatic and incremental as the as the best way to approach this and echo what Paul said with respect to the labs fear factor related to their core funding because because here's here's the irony the labs will say to you we need to do that work for all these other agencies that's more exciting and more innovative and more cutting edge because we cannot recruit the scientific talent that we need unless we're doing the really cool post 9-11 stuff. And we get them in the door and then we sort of casually segue them into the weapons program without them realizing it and then all of a sudden they become a weaponeer. And I'm being a little bit glib with that but, but, but essentially the labs will tell you we absolutely need to be doing this other stuff but we still want that core weapons budget to sustain the numbers that we think we need to have in terms of, of employment you know, stability here. So if the labs were able to get over, again, the fear factor related to, to um, that tether to the weapons mission, that would maybe be a first step and a big political step in terms of, of the lobbying effort, if you will, or the advocacy effort to move the agenda in a different direction and start diversifying in a, in a, a more strategic fashion than ad hoc weapon, you know, uh, work for others, uh, their own sort of incremental strategy for diversifying their mission, which is which is very ad hoc and piecemeal and very tactical in its nature. So, I, you know, 
a little bit repetitive of what, what, what Paul said, but, but the big gorilla, you know, the 800-pound gorilla in the, the advocacy d domain would, in fact, be the laboratory directors themselves. James, what's your advice? I want to return to this point uh, about developing a, a new scientific ethic. If you're going to ask what the future of U.S. national laboratories should be, you should involve the scientists themselves. You should not ask that question primarily of the national security bureaucracy. Because the scientists will be able to tell you that it is unscientific to expect that you can solve environmental sustainability from a nationalist perspective. It is impossible to solve political extremism or food safety or human health problems or economic problems these days from a nationalistic perspective. These require an international effort. It is unscientific to think that you uh, that nuclear weapons have been the only cause of the absence of great war, uh, great power war in, uh, since they've been invented. That's almost like saying the milk is white because the cow is white. The scientists require a better, higher standard of evidence and they know that these problems are now global and international. You have to unleash that somehow. You have to give them an institution where they can serve our national interests by at the same time uh, serving the interests of international security. I love that. That's a really interesting thought. Let's go to Peter on that, that guy who's big swing scenarios. I mean, what if there was some kind of new institution that was more global that the best and the brightest would want to flock to? I mean, could that actually shake up the other, the, you know, the legacy labs to actually catch up or try something different? I don't know. Any thoughts on building off of uh, his big swing idea there? Sure. I, I, I want to suggest that there are, you know, three, that, that a good strategy is a matter of balance. Uh, because the truth is, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you you're not going to shut everything down and start over, and, and, and it's a matter of how you manage that process of change over time. And uh, one strategy, uh, one element of it is inspiration. You know, that's part of what NASA was about. That's what cancer, National Cancer Institute, and I think what Jim is suggesting, the scale of global issues and problems. When I look at a lot of young people today, uh, I, I'm involved in social ventures and venture capital and so on, and what I see is a lot of people hungry to solve problems by uh, innovation, invention, doing I mean, stuff like you're doing, Pete. You know, this is a, an example. Uh, this is a non-governmental effort to solve the problem of, of democratic participation. Uh, and, and so uh, what uh, I think he's absolutely right. So one set of motivations for the labs is can we find uh, the missions which are uh, inspiring and attract young talent to want to participate, to want to engage, uh, to want to devote their lives to it. And I think there's enough <laughs> range of challenges that we've already discussed that suggests that could possibly be true. I think the second thing that will keep us going is uh, still the realities of fear whether it's fear of climate change, fear of uh, nuclear weapons, fear of biological threats, fears of proliferation, and so on. And, and I think that uh, is, is not going to go away as an important motivation for quite a long time. Uh, you know, the, the, the world is becoming less coherent, sadly, not more coherent. I, I wish uh, it, it were so, but it isn't. Uh, and so I think the fear motivation will still be an important driver of strategy. So, you know, uh, part of the enterprise will be focused on inspiration, part of the enterprise will be focused on uh, solving, uh, responding to those fears. And then the final is that we call it survival from a local political sense. Uh, powerful senators, congressmen, etc., uh, whose uh, districts benefit from the presence of all these research facilities. Uh, they uh, want to keep the jobs, the employment, uh, the facilities operating in their congressional and senatorial districts. So, uh, so having said that, uh, you know, I think a strategy that plays off of all three of those, uh, uh, adequately inspiring missions, ones that respond to the real fears of people, and then also take into account the political realities of congressional funding, etc., and, and uh, political survival. So if I was sitting there as a, as a lab director, I'd be thinking about all three of those elements in balancing my strategy. Terrific. Love it. Uh, Gregory, did you have any thoughts on the big swing strategy? Um... It's a, it just gives everyone a shot at, at a, a strategy, and then we're going to have to we're going to move to the next uh, wind up. Go ahead, Gregory. Well, indeed, I kind of agree that that 
big enterprises like the National Labs are, are mostly driven by either inspiration or desperation. And uh, I recall that when I was interviewing uh, with Edward Teller for uh, my, the postdoc I got, that the last thing he, he said to me was, was to abruptly turn to me and say, Will you work on weapons? <laughs> And uh, it was an interesting kickoff that because he later told me that that actually was a make or break for some of the people he interviewed, and he wanted to have it be clear. Uh, I, I, I agree that, that, that giving people a tech entrance into solving big problems is quite inspirational. I started several biotech companies with exactly that message, and they work out well. You can get very good people. Sometimes who will work very cheaply if they have an idealistic uh, voyage in mind. Um, that's why I, 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 when I say to my friends who, who are worried about uh, uh, the nuclear threat and work, even some people here at UC Irvine who talk about, about total nuclear disarmament, I point out that you, that's a long path, but that you, uh, it, it if you have to talk to the other people on the other side, uh, I have friends who were worried that uh, the tactical nuclear nukes might fizzle, some of them might fizzle. If you're worried about that, then you should be very sure about your weapons, be sure they're reliable, otherwise you can't make the argument that you should reduce the number. Uh, that kind of crosstalk is really crucial in this knowledgeable community, and it's between the labs and academe and other, and other forces at, at work, and Carnegie also. So, I think it's getting the the elevator pitch right at this stage to see what might be possible in this complicated negotiation. Uh, Elizabeth points out how interwoven and Byzantine this network is. Well, in, 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 still, you got to start with the elevator pitch. I love it. Coming from someone who's founded three biotech companies, you must have honed a few of them there. Um, Yes. Anyhow, this is we've unfortunately come to the end of uh, the time. We're very close to the end for our last kind of round here. Um, it's been an awesome conversation, though. And so, as we do in a lot of the, all these roundtables, is we give everyone a last chance to kind of, having reflected back on the 90-minute session, what really stood out for them as a kind of a, a big takeaway from them, something we might have accomplished or something you learned. But also, the second thing is, uh, given the our partners here who are really looking for big ideas and new ideas to do. You know, any final recommendation of, of what you might recommend uh, we do next, uh, or they do next, if uh, to really move the ball on this issue. Uh, so let's start with, um, I don't know, Peter, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you uh, first, since uh, you've been through this drill before. Give us the last uh, few words. You can take a couple minute, you know, minute or two. We've got enough time here um, to give you final thoughts. So, uh, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to give the uh, a commencement address at my alma mater, Rensselaer. Um, and uh, in, you know, this, since it was a, you know, a, 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 it was actually an outdoor field uh, full of nerds, engineers, scientists mostly, uh, all uh, uh, just coming out of school, either with bachelor's, master's, or PhDs. I might say most of the PhDs were not American, but that's another subject. Uh, but having said that, uh, my, the theme of my talk is uh, what's worth doing with your life? Uh, you know, uh, how, you know, w w what are the challenges that are worth really investing in, uh, in terms of your, the commitment of your careers? And I think at the top of that list, uh, uh, unequivocally, uh, is energy. Uh, that uh, it is so clear to me that we do not have uh, the energy source today for the long-term future of humankind. It may be fusion. It may be some advanced form of nuclear. It may be space-based solar. I, I don't know, some form of biological technologies. But it is very clear that uh, in the next century, we are going to need to have a, uh, a fundamental en energy revolution on the planet. Even if climate change weren't a problem, we'd still need to do that. Right. So, but it is a problem. So we not only ha we have a, a clear understanding of what that energy is. It has to be one that does not yield uh, more climate change. So that is uh, 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 the single greatest challenge I think facing our species, our civilization at the moment. So I go back to inspiration and fear, uh, and that is uh, I think uh, the inspiration is uh, meeting this great challenge. The fear is the failure to uh, meet that challenge. Um, and I think you said something at the beginning, Pete, 
and that is that I do think there is a growing national consensus, irrespective of Senator Imhoff and a few uh, other staggeringly ignorant members of the Republican Party uh, who have denied the realities of climate change. Uh, but uh, the country is ahead of them in that respect. And so I think there really is an opportunity to, and I, you know, I think we still need to keep the balance of the weapons facilities and so on, but of really thinking of a kind of deep long-term repurposing here to meet that great energy challenge for our civilization. Uh, the facilities, the people, the technical skills, and now I'm thinking about recruiting young people, young scientists, young engineers, and so on, across a range of disciplines required to solve that. It seems to me that if I were thinking about it, that's what I would focus. Terrific summation there. Uh, Libby, he's kind of playing into a theme you had as well about climate. You seem to be, what, what are your thoughts, final thoughts here in the session? Well, I would, I would hope, uh, you know, the New York Times article that you referenced, um, I would hope that, that we're seeing a, a, a grassroots shift and, and an apolitical environment for the discussion of energy futures, energy security, or if you want to put it under the mantle of climate change, if that's not too toxic. Um, because as I suggested, I think that that's the, the one uh, big ticket and big long-term multidisciplinary challenge under which all of these other elements of what the laboratories currently do uh, could could be you know fostered and, and continue to be nurtured and I don't mean nurtured in the sense of a continuance of, of either you know the weapons program per se or this piece but I think it is the energy challenge and climate change as, as a as a threat and the fear factor related to that for a large majority of the population that that could be that next really long-term vision to, to repurpose the laboratories. Um, then circle back a little bit to, to what what the foundations that, that uh, produce this program, what, what they could be doing, you know, until that moment, until we hit the tipping point, if you will, in terms of the politics surrounding that, I think it is going to be an incremental and very pragmatic approach that's more um, viable than, than anything else I can I can think of at this moment. It's hard to talk to you. <laughs> Good advice. Good balance advice. Uh, James, your thoughts on final thoughts here. I think first we need to empower the scientists to take a greater role in the national dialogue on security, both national security and global security. Uh, that's a sort of high altitude observation, but I don't know the specifics of how you do that, but I think that that is a, a community that we have not really embraced their thinking on and given them a, a powerful voice. Number two, I think that if you did have an alternative vision for a national security laboratory network whereby you could take the nuclear weapons piece and put it somewhere else, perhaps in the Department of Defense, uh, then you have to decide what these uh, network of, na of national laboratories then is going to work on. And I think we've already discussed quite a few things there that are possible uh, in terms of global security threats that I think, frankly, are uh, more in my presence of mind in terms of what our nation is going to be facing uh, in the decades ahead. As in terms of one um, small-scale recommendation or a possible small-scale innovation would be you create at one of the existing national laboratories a global security center. That center does all unclassified work. It can network with other national laboratories, the, the national laboratories or academies of sciences for, of our partner nations around the world, and it can invite um, people from all over the world to work on common global security problems. And this is, could be done for a modest investment, you know, uh, compared to life extension programs and building new pits, you could uh, fund such a center for 50 to 100 million dollars a year, that would be ample, it would be extremely exciting for many of the people at the laboratories and they'd all be uh, crawling to uh, get involved in this center. Oh, that's an awesome idea. Thanks for that, and thanks for wrapping up. And then, um, Gregory, let's hear your last uh, few thoughts, and uh, go ahead. I, I like James' last idea. That sounds like a very good way to start with such ideas. Um, you know, what really strikes me when I'm in the Bay Area is that 
the people out at Livermore uh, envy the people on the peninsula. <laughs> they're not just doing the technologies that everybody's paying attention to and writing apps for, they're also getting rich. But, but th there's a feeling, I think, poorly expressed, th th that th the momentum has been taken away from that part of the technological enterprise. Nonetheless, it's a big budget. Um, and it struck me again when I was talking to Elon Musk about getting to Mars, and he said, we really need better transport. It'll solve a lot of the other problems. Uh, that uh, I'd like to see us try to bring these communities closer together to have parallel interests. It's not a mistake for Google to just put a billion dollars into SpaceX, primarily because they want to be able to bring the Internet to the whole planet through satellites. Um, but, uh, uh, but it's also... The, the parts of the really innovative scientific commercial community really work together a lot better than the people all over at the national lab level in, in many ways. At least they're more interested in, they get together for dinner a whole lot more, let's put it that way. Uh, uh, and uh, Sergey Brin said to me th that he really was a, a space nick and he was looking for a way to do things in that direction. Uh, maybe not just give hand money to SpaceX, but really shape the program. I remember, Sergey was born in Russia. Uh, so I think what, what James brought up was really important that we have to energize and, and utilize this kind of suppressed energy and concern. Everybody reads the papers, well, some people, uh, and everybody knows the problems are large. And to find a way to say your government is on this, your government is going to work with the wealth of the American technological community, including the private that everybody pays attention to, is a really important message and it, and it will help you sell it with Congress. So I've, throughout my talk here I've given specific examples of things like geoengineering and nuclear thermal rockets because I, I think putting something on concrete on the table focuses interest and they may be bad ideas after all, but being concrete instead of uh, long sentences with lots of passive voice uh, uh, is a way to move the, the ball forward in this game. And you've got to proceed by specific examples to get people interested. They're not excited by policy papers. They're excited by horizons. That's my main point. Fantastic way to wrap it up. We're going to have the last few words, though, from Paul and then uh, to finish up. And, uh, but really a terrific contribution there. Uh, I, I, I'll end by thanking folks, but before I get there, I, I want to say I, I, I totally appreciate and agree with this um, tension, I'll call it, between inspiration and desperation. And I'd really prefer to have us all think about inspiration. Um, maybe let desperation take care of itself. So, so what I'm endorsing, I guess, is a vision, a positive and point positive goal to have not only the labs but our, our national security thinking and, and um, culture be about solving challenges, not not um, being scared, you know, the bejesus scared out of us and oh we have to respond to something. We should rise to a challenge, not not feel um, paralyzed by it. I think I really like Tim's idea about empowering the scientists and I want to extend upon that because one point I'd like to make that we all know, but I think we sometimes forget, and maybe for the audience listening in, this has become a democratic issue. I mean, for decades, the labs were not democratic, and they should not have been. They were part of a secret national security complex, and, and rightly so in the 40s and 50s and so on. But now we're in a different world where we, as a public, are aware of the extent of the national nuclear weapons complex, their intersection with the Department of Defense, and so on. And so I, I would like to make a pitch to um, keep in mind that, that we all get a vote here. We literally get a vote. We get a vote of who we elect to Congress to make these kinds of decisions. We vote with our dollars and our tax money. And so um, for those of us who may think, oh, well, this is for the experts, yes, it is, and it's for democracy as well. Um, and then finally, the, the idea of a global international security center and Greg's idea about you know, absolutely make something tangible I think that speaks to the comment I made earlier about a middle a middle approach. We want to be audacious but grounded in the reality and, and, and articulating some very concrete ideas that appeal to scientific thinkers and technologists 
and also appeal to those outside, I'll call it the fence line, in places like Google and Tesla and others, where we have more intersection between the private sector and the lab infrastructure, I think will go a long way. Um, I've, I heard some concrete ideas that I think I'm excited about. I want to thank everyone for their time. I know it's a, it's a lot to ask people to sit down for nearly two hours. Um, but I also enjoyed meeting many of you who I haven't met before and, and hope that we can continue the conversation and to our audience as well. All right. And that's a great time to rot. We went a little bit over. So thanks to everyone. Awesome conversation. Package this all up and have it out in a couple of days. Uh, anyhow, fantastic group. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you later.